All righty. Um, what are we doing on time here? Because I know we're right. Just, just speak through the break. You have this load that you had. So, okay. I mean, if you keep to the 35, sure. 40 minutes. Okay. I can, I'll try to finish up a little bit early. I don't want to be between everyone here and uh, beer or whatever to the break. So, uh, uh, yes, my name's Mark. Um, I'm here to talk about um, something that I think kind of intersects the two previous talks that we just heard. So, I think it kind of ties the two together. Um, um, I'd like to uh, introduce myself again just briefly. Um, basically, I run the uh, research team at Arbor Networks, and uh, we are obviously very interested in the second topic of DDoS, but uh, more and more my team is focusing on malware research, much, much like the first topic that we heard, so why I think that um, I'll actually be able to tie the two talks together. Um, so um, I manage a team of researchers. Uh, most, of, most of us um, are very uh, comfortable looking at assembly all day long. Um, so, uh, you know, oftentimes I get a lot of questions. All right, you know, what do you guys do? What tools do you guys use? How do you do your job? And uh, probably th the same as anyone that, um, that does this, right? So, you know, we use Ida Pro, we look at assembly a lot. Um, and so, basically, this, the reason that we have had to do this is because um, DDoS malware is something that was kind of always a bit of a underground. Uh, it wasn't, there wasn't really, you know, a place you could go read the newest blog on some, you know, um, you know, Dirt Jumper Drive or Pandora or some of these, you know, botnets. And so we basically developed this uh, technique um, in order to basically find needles out of haystacks, um, looking for specific families that were new and uh, et cetera. Um, and uh, so we've basically taken that and uh, expanded that research to cover, you know, traditional threats, um, um, such as the ones that we heard about in the first talk and, um, as well. So um, it was just a natural capability we had, and we um, have, have extended it further into uh, sort of the um, more advancing threat space. So um, real quick, um, you know, we basically have, um, from our uh, relationship with the uh, service providers, um, we have a very sort of large sensorium of uh, information. Um, so we actually have, um, you know, a, a fair, a large percentage of the tier one and tier two ISPs uh, around the world as our customers, and this is a, a very great data source for us to pull from. Um, so I, I put together a, a brief slide here, um, kind of showing what we do, why we do it, and kind of why I'm here talking. Um, so, so I mentioned earlier, we want a very sort of broad coverage here. We want to focus on more than just DDoS, right? Um, we want to focus on uh, interesting threats. Um, we want to understand uh, botnet, um, botnet composition and how, how the botnets are actually moving to um, launch some of these attacks. We'll actually see later in the presentation some examples. Um, and I think there's some very interesting um, indicators that we have that, that we want to uh, turn around and uh, utilize for our research. Um, honeypot data, for example, um, monitoring CNCs, which we'll see later in this presentation. Um, I, think, I think there's some very interesting um, things to, to figure out from this, and uh, we can basically turn this data around and um, give it to you guys to help protect and mitigate these threats. Um, so unlike a lot of folks, um, you know, we, we don't sell a, um, uh, we have a, you know, a network, network based product. I mean, that's kind of our lens that we look at our research through. Um, so the goal for us of, um, you know, sticking our nose in uh, uh, IDA Pro all day long, long is really to understand botnets um, and the CNC protocol. So really our main goal here is to actually be able to emulate um, the protocol um, so we do things like pull crypto keys out of binaries and basically um, inject bots into these botnets to do analysis. Um, and um, it's kind of a unique approach. Um, we both use static and dynamic techniques we'll see here in a second. Um, so we, we kind of provide sort of a hybrid approach to this. Um, so um, lastly, um, I, mentioned, I mentioned earlier sort of the, the focus of my talk is being able to take these large amounts of data and to distill it down to actual intelligence that we can uh, hand over to CERT teams and ISPs and, um, you know, basically the internet community. So um, one thing that Arbor has capable of doing that I think is relatively interesting is that um, we can take a sample, um, for example, that, that we, we've gotten access to. Um, we can see the actual actor um, ordering attack uh, via C2, and then we can actually see the flow data um, in, in the case of DDoS. Um, we actually can see uh, flows um, around the world, uh, basically ending up um, at this sort of victim, um, these victim resources. So I think that's kind of a cool, uh, cool capability. Um, and we're trying to push the limits of that um, to things that we're not 
uh, you know, sort of beyond our core competencies. So, you know, looking at email, emails, executable, spam campaigns, um, et cetera. So, um, just a quick uh, three slides of what this, what I summarized in the previous slides. So, an example of a, um, a, C, a panel that was used by a CNC um, that was used uh, specifically to attack uh, industrial food processors. Uh, well, somebody on the team took this, um, basically understood this, which is hard to read, that's kind of the point. Um, but basically it's a uh, description of how the C2 works and essentially wrote Python code that looks like this. So again, related very much to the first talk that we saw, being able to understand how to rip, a, rip, a, rip apart binaries, figure out keys, and be able to move forward with um, creating interesting um, analysis of the, uh, the attacker. Okay, so um, I, I want to step back a, a, a second before I move into the next portion of my presentation. Um, basically, um, and mention you know, what we do with all this data. So we have access to lots of data, um, and really our goal is to turn around um, in many cases and work with folks to remediate um, these problems that are impacting countries or networks. Um, um, a lot of the backbone or internet exchanges, et cetera. So, um, you know, this, these are not necessarily uh, our, our customers. They're folks that we, uh, you know, uh, ring up on the phone and say, hey, look, we've noticed this particular uh, campaign that's going. Can we, is there anything we can do to help you with this? Um, so, you know, part of this is kind of a good guy, uh, you know, uh, thing, but, you know, really, at the end of the day, um, you know, we are really feel like our hands are into, in this and we are actually trying to mediate a lot of these issues. Um, so I, I just want to give that a bit, bit of a backdrop um, because basically all the data and analysis that um, is in this portion of the presentation, we actually make it um, available for you through our portal. Um, and uh, so um, I just want to mention that real quick. Um, right, real quick. So uh, where do we get data from? Um, there's two to three major sources of data that I, I'd like to talk about. Um, sometimes when people see these slides, they, uh, it, seems, it seems a little bit unreal. Um, I mean, there's probably other folks in this room who um, also have uh, similar sort of analysis capabilities. So this is, uh, um, you know, this is real, I guess. This exists. You can touch it, et cetera. Um, so recently, um, we've um, deployed a pretty interesting um, set of honeypot sensors across um, a good chunk of the ever-shrinking dark IPv4 space. Um, um, and essentially, the architecture is that we co-locate these boxes in uh, var various ISPs um, who are willing to give access to uh, their dark space. And uh, essentially, we run um, what amounts to uh, a honey client that we've developed. We actually have an image. We slap on these boxes, and we deploy them. So we actually um, uh, deploy these boxes. We actually control um, sort of the software on there, and uh, it's sort of a mixture between a low and medium interaction honeypot, um, to give you an idea. So part of this has been developed um, through sort of uh, open source channels, and part of that we've just sort of uh, customized for ourselves. So. Um, Basically, I mentioned before, we, we basically run an IDS um, and a honeypot on this, and my team actually maintains the code for this, so it's not like a, can't go buy one of these, whatever, it's, it's just what we use for our own internal resource research. Um, we currently have access to close to 2 million IPs, um, so uh, uh, I guess you probably shouldn't read everything, uh, believe everything you read about shrinking IPv4 space. I mean, it is a problem, but we still have a good amount of ac a good access to it to do research on, so I think that's actually Fairly, uh, fairly exciting. Um, a large amount of the data that we get from this is based on scanning. Um, um, most of what we see or we believe to see are, are kind of new unknown attacks. Um, we see the, you know, like the basic you know, background radiation of the internet and you know, stuff that you know, everyone still sees, slammer, et cetera. Um, and we've, we've tried to do in the last year is to correlate some of this to, to um, uh, vulnerability disclosure to try to tie um, to tr tie to try to tie a um, cause and effect to the scanning and, and later exploitation. Um, it's been sort of a mixed bag being able to do that, but I think it's it's relatively interesting. What we do find a lot of is misconfigured devices, networks, uh, networks that have um, uh, questionable configurations, et cetera. We do see a lot of that. Um, so essentially, once these, what we call unknown attacks, so these could be things like, uh, 
things uh, such as MSRPC or some of these more low-level protocols. Um, we actually hand them off to, to a piece of the code that, that can actually speak back to them, um, very basic, um, very basic uh, communication, um, and we use that to um, do all sorts of things. We may develop some, um, some signatures to understand what this is. Um, you know, we may, may capture data to this uh, effect for research, et cetera. Um, but most of what um, is interesting to the sort of the internet community is, is a lot of these uh, scans um, and being able to have some sort of early warning system of, of what we expect this to impact greater and in a greater uh, capacity. I think a good example of this is some of the uh, NTP attacks we've seen of recent and, and this region specifically. Um, we did have some sort of early warning signs. Um, you know, it's kind of like the weatherman. It's 20-20 uh, hindsight in, in many cases. But we did have some early signs um, in this uh, with these NTP attacks um, that, that did show that this was going to be um, come an issue that was actually caught via this sensorium, not necessarily via other channels. Well, uh, we did have some tells there, but this was a more interesting one. Um, okay, so um, I want to switch gears. So this is this is one uh, methodology that we use to gather data, um, and uh, and later in my talk I'll show you sort of what we do with that data. But we do um, this the second um, sort of um, uh, analysis capability that we that we currently have is more malware driven. Um, so I, I think you anybody who's um, done any sort of automated malware analysis has probably seen something very similar to what I'm going to present. Um, I would like I, one of the reasons I think it's interesting to bring up in a context like this is it doesn't really take you know a huge research organization to do this. We've actually seen folks on um, more the local and regional level um, cert teams that we uh, work with that have very similar systems to do do stuff like this. Um, and really, the, our, our our goal of this is again to extract information that we can then turn around to folks remediating some of these problems and actually hand over a list of compromised machines on their network so they actually can work with us to clean up. Um, from a network point of view, you have to understand that, that really the, the holy grail for us is access to these servers that, that are being used as C2s or command and controls. Um, you know, from a network perspective, we actually never get to see that. And so partnering with uh, governments and uh, CERT teams, we actually get to, uh, in many cases, get access to uh, um, some of this code. So that's actually super exciting from our perspective. Um, but anyways, what I wanted to cover real quick here is just, um, you know, the data that we send to them, it has to come from somewhere, right? So we, we, we have to have some information um, other than, hey, these machines are compromised and uh, we believe they're involved as botnet. You know, how do we kind of come to that conclusion, right? Um, so obviously one way was the system I mentioned before, sort of uh, the honeypot system, but increasingly um, just I think due to a, a, a number of factors, sort of the decrease in uh, warmable exploits and sort of the rise of the more targeted uh, exploits, uh, more attacker basically exercising more precision over what he's doing. Um, we, we tend to use the data more in our malware analysis system. Um, um, so anyways, um, like many people, we basically uh, get samples from uh, lots of folks. We, you know, we trade data. Uh, if anyone's interested in doing that, we do that all day long. Um, we get data from our honeypot network that we mentioned before. Um, you know, we get it from, from blogs, um, sometimes from our products themselves, et cetera. And um, <coughs> really, one of the, the most difficult things in a system like this that we found is really prioritizing what we want to go research. Um, because you know, when you deal with you know, half a million unique samples a day, or you know, many of the, uh, the numbers that uh, a, a lot of the folks in this industry deal with, um, you really don't have um, time to go through all of those. I mean, given our original use case of DDoS, um, that was actually much more attractive, because you know, that number was you know, really, really truly a needle in a haystack. Um, but as we expand our scope, we found that um, you know, prioritizing is more important. So we need to understand what sort of things we're interested in, is, it sort of, uh, et cetera. So really, this is where we've applied some interesting clustering approaches. I think that's what most folks do in this, uh, in this uh, area. But this is really the most, most difficult part of this whole sort of workflow, is trying to choose what to look at. 
Um, basically, once our analysts come in the office in the morning, you know, they expect to have you know, get, uh, all the results from last night you know, sort of sitting at their desk, and they use it um, sort of from a human perspective to then do further triage and figure out what, what they're interested in looking at that day. And then the next day, the process starts again, and then there's the weekend, and you get double data, right? Um, so um, I think um, we mentioned a, a bit earlier in the first talk, there's many approaches for analyzing a, a sample, right? There's uh, you know, true static approaches, such as we saw in the uh, first talk, and then there's more dynamic, uh, dynamic approaches. We actually use both. Probably shouldn't be a huge, uh, huge uh, surprise. Um, we do use the, the advantage to static analysis that we can do a lot quicker. We don't have to spin up a sandbox. We don't have to run the sample. You know, um, uh, an analyst doesn't have to spend uh, a good amount of time in a debugger, et cetera. Um, so, you know, we do the same things that uh, most people do. We, uh, we decrypt samples. We unpack them if we know what they are um, from, from a static perspective. Um, we run sample A-B detections, um, and we have the ability to further uh, uh, prioritize this using just simple YAR rules, much like, you know, a CERT organization or IR team would do. I mean, very similar sort of process. Um, then we actually run um, a, a subset of these samples, depending on what's sort of important. Um, there's certain campaigns that, that we're interested in that we sort of bubble up to the top. We have certain relationships with certain uh, organizations and teams. When we see the stuff related to them, we sort of prioritize it. So um, um, we actually uh, run the samples. Um, we actually uh, uh, you know, use sort of a simple uh, IDS system, um, sort of IDS plus sandbox, um, to get a lot, of, a lot more data, which is you know, metadata associated with a sample, et cetera. Um, and then once we've actually run the samples, the real goal for us is a really strong uh, memory dump, um, which we can then use to extract keys and perform crypto and essentially do the, uh, the work I described at the earlier part of the presentation where we actually have a Python script that uh, we can use to decrypt traffic given a, given a sample or given a piece of traffic. Um, so as you might expect, we have to cram all the stuff into a big database, uh, which presents some of its own problems. Um, this is the database that we query whenever we're asked a question, hey, what do you guys know about this piece of malware? Or what do you guys know about this IP address? Or why did this IP address show up on one of your reports? That's mine. <laughs> uh, you know, what can we do? Um, so this database stores all this information. This is what drives the reports that go, go out to you guys. Um, um, et cetera. Um, so I think there's you know, pretty standard stuff here. We ex extract network indicators. Again, that's what we're really interested in from our perspective. Um, we try to do approximate matches in many cases. Um, we, something called fuzzy hashing, which is this. Um, perhaps you guys saw, saw VirusTotal re recently started supporting impash. It's a concept of being able to f find two files that are not exactly the same, but approximately the same. Um, which is useful, especially when uh, the bad guys can just, uh, you know, create an arbitrary number of uh, files um, via some of their builder processes. Um, and we also produce out of this database all the digests that go to our analyst. Again, this is what they look up when they wake up in the morning, um, um, see what's kind of new out there. Um, we store mutexes. I mean, anything that, you know, a typical IR team would be interested in going down and looking at, um, you know, whenever they do malware analysis as well. Um, um, I have a, a quick example here um, after this where I talk about our botnet monitoring. But a bit, uh, essentially, once you have the ability to, uh, to, under, you know, to uh, find a botnet CNC, and once you have the ability to both encrypt and decrypt data to that botnet um, CNC, well, the, the logical thing to do next is to go join the botnet and uh, see what it asks you to do. So that's something we do. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, we also have been moving more toward a real-time uh, data pushing out perspective. Um, a lot of the CERT teams that we work with um, have requested this, and uh, um, so we've, we've moved to that model. Um, and we do some, you know, we try to do some threat actor profiling sort of at this level. Uh, again, that's tricky, as we all know. Um, and then we, we basically take all that data and shove it into to our feeds um, and then also to the, to the uh, intelligence uh, IPN, uh, essentially like abuse emails we send out to companies, um, et cetera. Um, I probably should have started with this slide. I, I now regret my slide order. But um, anyways, um, we, we share a lot of this data pretty much globally. Um, again, it's, it's Part of the sort of the responsibility we feel is, is having a sort of a global presence. Um, we work with about 100 CERT teams 
um, submitting data to them. Um, many of these CERT teams get data from us and put into their ticketing and response systems. That's uh, interesting. Um, it's pretty much a, a, a cross-section of users. Um, we also provide some of this data in a portal. Most of the portal data is DDoS-specific, but if you're interested in that, you can contact me or any of the Arbor folks, and we can uh, set up accounts uh, if you're interested in, in how that works. And uh, I just put some uh, sort of factoids, um, just showing some of the coverage that we have. But um, I think we have uh, a fairly good uh, visibility across the internet. Um, and. Um, about uh, 6,000 ASNs we, we do uh, this um, on-demand reporting for. So uh, essentially, uh, to, to, in other words, uh, once you log into the portal, you can basically register ANs or TLDs or things that you're interested in re receiving reports on. And uh, we currently have uh, roughly half the ASNs we're reporting to. So many folks come to us um, helping, looking to help remediate issues. Um, we actually do that as well, um, et cetera. And we, we trade a bunch of data. All right. so. Um, what, uh, I guess uh, I just want to walk through two brief examples of kind of this data in action, and then we'll, we'll go break together. Um, a few screenshots, you know, obviously uh, internal tools are never pretty, right, and never should see the light of day, but yet I'm breaking that golden rule. Um, an example of a sample um, that we look at, you can see we have a number of uh, dynamic um, execution environments. We actually run on Windows 7, we run on Windows XP. Uh, we also do Android. Uh, we run stuff on Android, et cetera. Um, and then basically that gives us reports and memory dumps, and that's what a lot of this future analysis is based on. Um, so, you know, probably again, most, most of you guys are probably familiar with this. Um, we generate a bunch of connection data. Um, we, the, really, the goal for us is up in this corner here. We actually try to tag these samples as belonging to some malware family. Um, again, you know, just uh, Trojan dot generic or something is kind of a fail for us. So we try to be very specific about the malware family, what it's, what it is, what it does, etc. We find that when we interface externally, that um, that's really the first thing people ask: What is this? You know, is, it, is this a click frog com campaign, or is this you know something I actually need to deal with now? So um, we need to have good answers for that. Um, this isn't the best sample, but uh, this one is one related to the Zeus campaign. Uh, you can see DNS lookups and uh, HTTP requests, etc. Um, again, we we do some sort of heuristic-based detections. Um, I, I think many products do this, many companies do this. Um, we actually do this kind of uh, uh, from our own in, in kind of a maybe a unique way. Um, but we basically have a scriptable environment um, that w when we actually run the sample on the machine, that we can. Um, access various things um, and, and, and check for various things. So we check to see if, uh, you know, new, new files were created, new events were created in this one. This is actually how we detected this particular one. Um, so again, this is probably all standard. Um, this next section, I think, is uh, an example of something we do that's kind of unique. So in this particular case, we detected this was a, uh, a Zeus sample and um, you know, Zeus is a peer-to-peer -peer oriented botnet. And so, uh, again, once we have the key, um, and once we have the initial sort of peer list, um, we actually go through and enumerate all the hosts. And so, um, for this particular sample, uh, its, peer, its static list of peers are here, and we have a list of all their keys um, and the important protocol they use. So, this allows us to, <coughs> this allows us to really understand the capabilities of a botnet, really understand um, uh, how big it is, answer these, these sort of questions, because um, we have a number of samples um, uh, that sort of, uh, that point, we'll actually see in the last part of the presentation, but when, when you actually graph this out and understand these relationships, you can actually start to plot out some of the capabilities of these botnets. Um, so when the uh, previous section of my slides, we talked a bit about um, building a better bot replicant or botnet infiltration. Um, we, do, we do this. I think it's a relatively interesting thing we do. Um, it's actually, uh, uh, you'll see in the next slide, uh, it's code name uh, Blade Runner. We actually did a, a talk on this at BotConf in France uh, in December. So if you're interested in kind of what we did, uh, I think we have a good like 14 page paper and uh, you can read up on it. Um, it's again, nothing that's secret, nothing that you guys couldn't go out and do. Uh, it's fairly straightforward. Um, but basically, the idea is we have a number of botnet families we want more information on. Um, we've used this to monitor la large campaigns. We've had customers uh, who've come to us that are 
are you know, worried about elections, perhaps, or are worried about um, some big event in their country. Um, and they said, hey, let us know if you see anyone uh, targeting us. And, uh, and so we've done that, um, interestingly enough, and worked with the CERT teams to, uh, to remediate those sort of things. So again, um, <laughs> actually, I have to apologize to, to the first speaker. I actually am going to use virus total on my slides, so you guys can, uh, uh, anyways, interestingly enough. But um, so this particular case, we actually had a, um, uh, a sample that we were tracking. Um, and like any CNC, um, it basically had a, um, um, uh, we actually understand the protocol. So basically, once we joined the spotnet, we were sent down a command. Uh, simple registration command, and typically um, what, we, what we're most interested in from a botnet perspective is all the update commands. Um, one of our sort of philosophical um, uh, conclusions we've come to that if we monitor the botnets and the updates, then we'll always essentially have what we believe to be the most uh, freshest version of the malware they're sending down. So it'd be interesting to see if anyone agrees or disagrees with that, but in this particular case, uh, we were ordered to update um, our machine with this particular uh, um, uh, new uh, piece of, it's sort of like a second level uh, infection, so we were told to update this, and um, I'll, um, I'll briefly talk about what we did. So we, we checked the hash and virus total, um, and you know, wasn't really recognized by any AV vendors. I guess in this particular case, uh, you know, um, referring to the comments in the first talk, um, we, we wouldn't really expect this to. I mean, we, we actually believe this to be fresh code. Um, um, in this particular case, um, I think there was one, one uh, wrong description of what this was. Um, again, from our perspective, we're really interested in understanding what the botnet family is, um, what it's associated with. And so we don't normally do this, but in this particular case, we uploaded one just kind of for proof of concept, I guess. Um, and then we basically compared this to the information that we, we had on this particular one. I, I think, um, I don't remember if this was a gaming company, I think it was, um, that we actually passed this information on to. Um, but we basically said, hey, look, here's the CNC, here's the commands being run, uh, et cetera. So I think more than, uh, you know, more than a treatise on AV, this is more about how we approach um, this. Um, and again, I don't think we'd expect these to be really uh, detected. Um, but from our perspective, um, you know, we basically wanted to, uh, to understand uh, how we, uh, what sort of data we had on this and how it stacked up to sort of the general community. Um, the last piece, uh, last piece of my talk, uh, I'd like to talk a, a bit about what we do with some of this data. So if you're monitoring all these botnets, um, there's a, uh, you, you guys have probably heard of this sort of pay per install model, which is very common, which in, instead of building up a botnet of your own, you're actually going to go out and sort of contract that to somebody else. And so, you know, we, um, you know studying flows and IPs and domains, um, we honestly, we see a lot of this infrastructure being reused. Um, and it's also something that we use to sort of differentiate what we believe to be a more targeted attack into something that is just sort of, you know, plain, plain everyday malware, correct? Um, so we can kind of, we kind of use that to draw a bit of a distinction. I think it's uh, maybe weak, but for us it works. Um, and, you know, understanding, you know, what sort of is the sort of malware du jour, right? What, what, is, what are people using now, et cetera? So we basically um, tracked a few of these paper install guys but, um, um, and basically using the IP name and the domain name, we correlated them to effectively what we believe to be the same operator. Now, there's tons of competition in the botnet world, tons of botnet takeovers. You know, there's plenty of ways that this data can cannot be, ex you know, uh, construed a bit differently, but um, this particular one, um, we actually had an initial infection, um, what we believe to be NITAL, and we essentially saw um, all kinds of um, other malware used. We, we believe in many of these cases, you know, some of these threats don't work, you know, they're actively mitigated. Some of this is, is attackers rotating through infrastructure, uh, again, uh, by behest of a customer. Um, and so this particular botnet, um, uh, Athena botnet, which is uh, one we've been tracking for a while. Um, this is the th sort of things that this botnet installs. So you can see everything from uh, zero access to uh, Litecoin, all, you know, everything that you know, we don't care about uh, <laughs> uh, and we, we're trying to clean up, right? So this is an interesting study for us. And so what we were curious is, okay, so we have these attackers, we kind of understand his resources a bit, and we see this sort of progression of malware. Um, sort of what is he doing and kind of how he was, how, how has he been, uh, has he been successful, I think was a question we were trying to answer. And so in many cases, we think um, 
the stuff was blocked. Um, it wasn't as profitable as he thought. Um, this is probably somebody who is, is uh, operating this botnet essentially for revenue generation. Um, just a few more slides here. Um, but we built up some graphs um, to sort of understand um, the relationships between the command and control and their targets, right? Um, which, which is interesting, because in many times we'll see, um, we recently um, uh, were watching, watching one campaign specifically where um, the attacker was very intent on one target and started to build up more and more resources to that end. Oftentimes, and I think that's more rare, I think what we more see is attackers have you know, a finite amount of resources and they're going to go after what they can accomplish with that. So they, they change sort of tactics in midstream mid, mid, uh, mid a bit. Um, all right, so this botnet uh, um, is interesting um, because it, it's a very highly connected graph. So some of you folks out there who are interested in uh, graph theory probably know, know many more ways to analyze this than I do. Um, but essentially what we look at, um, you know, just from a visualization, because it's very hard to, to just look at this in raw data. So the visualiz visualization helps actually a lot. Uh, but this particular botnet was one that we were, we were monitoring. We knew actually had a DDoS slant to it um, and did many of the attacks that we saw in the second presentation, like the Rudy attack and et cetera. So um, we had actually underst understood its protocol and we're watching the attacks that it ordered and what, what targets it was going after, right? So it was interesting to watch, again, that there were some focuses on some key targets, but in many cases, um, this, this attacker would uh, maybe also go after some other targets that were we, we believe to be kind of of, of less value. Um, this particular one is, campaign is a pretty internal Russian uh, sort of uh, scene. So um, ma many of you guys may or may not know, but there's a lot of services that you can get um, in the, what we call booter services, where you can go and log into a uh, uh, website and pay five bucks and get like three minutes of DDoS or something like this, and you pick your target, whoever it is, and maybe you want to kick some off Xbox or you know whatever whatever your real rationale is. And so these these um, this is probably someone who operates some sort of uh, DDoS as a service, if you will, uh, type of infrastructure. And some of these graphs get get really crazy, um, you know, understanding again. Um, how these targets relate, we think, is something of further study and something that, that my team is uh, interested in uh, perhaps partnering with folks. Again, in many, in many cases, we can do this traffic analysis, but I think the real interesting stuff is uh, still on the host of the CNCs. Um, um, and even with our probes in the botnet, we don't really see, see all of this. For example, some of these bot work differently in different geographies, um, and so how we monitor and how we probe them is, in, in many cases, limited. Um, yeah, I think I can probably wrap things up, get you guys to break a bit quicker. Um, I think if there's anything else I want to cover. Um, you know, um, obviously, um, domain names and IP addresses um, pr present a very interesting twist on this topology. Um, and so um, I, we see a lot of times attackers attacking directly the host. Um, um, perhaps there's uh, some sort of DDoS service or some sort of DNS based uh, service in front of those. And so, you know, again, demonstrating to us that some of these attackers are a bit more savvy. They understand uh, um, sort of the idea of collateral damage and when they can sort of inflict on it. And uh, yeah, I, I guess I, c I can sort of wrap things up there. Um, Anyways, um, I, I just kind of want to close saying, you know, um, that you know, this is a lot of this is sort of a goodwill service. You know, if, uh, if there's anything we can do to help you guys uh, fight botnets, uh, nothing, uh, nothing excites us better. Um, honestly, um, if you're interested in getting information, um, uh, data from from our analysis system that we uh, showed out again, it's. It's, uh, we're generally very free about that. And um, probably most importantly, if you're interested in sharing data or contributing data, swapping data, uh, we'd love to do that as well. So uh, thanks to Fernando and this, uh, the, uh, you guys. Uh, it's been great three talks. So. Uh, si alguien tiene alguna pregunta para Mark, por favor, acérquese a los micrófonos que están a ambos costados. Bueno, pido entonces un aplauso para Mark.